Probably gonna be fine for an hour. I was thinking about going and getting my charger, but it's not worth it. Thank you. Pretty happy that the uh, function sequence ended up working in the end, but couldn't get it working with monotransformers. So. All right. Uh, so uh, I am uh, Devin Stewart. Uh, I work at uh, Twilio in San Francisco. Uh, I work on a team uh, that does programmable fax. So the fax is still a thing, uh, as is actually definitely true in Japan. Uh, sort of surprising when you talk to people in the States. Um, but this is a product, or this is a project that I've been working on for the past year. Uh, it is a code generator for Ock HTTP that uses uh, Scala Meta, Cats, and Circe. Um, Scala Meta has been a tremendous joy to work with, so uh, I actually gave a talk on Scala Meta at Scala City last year. Uh, so this is sort of an extension to that. Um, the problems that we have uh, in the current industry as actually still code formatting. Um, as your system grows, as your company grows, as your products grow, especially with microservice architecture, um, there are many changes that are required to uh, conventional uh, REST endpoints or otherwise uh, the, the system topology changes. Um, it becomes a problem when you can't version your uh, APIs effectively. Uh, it ends up causing a lot of uh, unpleasantness for even just trying to keep all of the different systems up to date. You have so many different clients that were written by hand in the same language. Um, but then if you start going to other languages, like uh, if your back end is in Scala and your front end is in uh, Node.js or is in uh, React or something like that, um, then you have to manually write both of those clients. You have to write the front end client and the back end server uh, ends up creating um, some sort of possibility for slippage, right? So uh, just maintaining these systems is actually very time consuming. Uh, so even the people that are very diligent and want to do this work is actually takes a lot of time in order to uh, just make this uh, make these changes in large systems, uh, even if, if people are interested in doing it. Um, and then additionally, if the framework that you're using under the hood, if, if your web framework or some sort of concurrency framework or even the, the libraries that you're using uh, change and their APIs uh, are no longer compatible, then you have a lot of work to do even just upgrading those systems to the latest version of that code, uh, it can be time consuming. So uh, and then additionally, the, one of the primary problems with any sort of documentation is that most of your documentation is not compiled. Uh, and even if you're using something like Tut, Tut compiles the product of your documentation. It doesn't actually include documentation into your product. It's sort of the opposite of what I'm talking about today. Uh, I want a system that you can write a specification and then generate your servers in a type safe way. You can generate your clients in any language that you want and it all works and is as best as we can make it correct by construction. And the, the last problem that we face in uh, the industry today is that non-technical readers uh, can't always go into the code. So uh, if you have a manager, the manager is 
unlikely to be able to assist with understanding why a particular bug exists uh, or if even looking at the overall system architecture is not always a way for people that are technically competent in other realms like systems operations people or um, any sort of uh, like architecture um, uh, individuals, uh, high-level high architects, it's unreasonable to expect that they will go to every single team and look in every single uh, product that they're working on. Um, even something as simple as just graphing traffic between services ends up being uh, much more cumbersome than it needs to be because it's not always clear what is there on the network. It's, you have to do a lot of work to find out even what the, those programs should be talking to each other using. Like this protocol isn't always obvious. So this causes a lot of frustration. Uh, so this is the setup that's in this project that I'm running right now. Um, this will be made available uh, by the end of hopefully this week. If you are really eager, um, invites are open. Um, it's just uh, I'm trying to make sure that the, all the artifacts are being published to Bintray before this becomes widely available. Um, but if you're interested in it, even in its current state, please don't hesitate to talk to me. Uh, so this is the current state of writing uh, routes using the ACA routing DSL uh, in ACA HTTP. Uh, you have your HTTP method, you have your path, and you have some sort of business logic uh, here, string interpolation. Even this, though, there's actually a lot of business logic embedded in your routing layer. Uh, you can imagine that this will end up getting larger and larger uh, as your routes grow or if you're rushing to get a deadline or something like that. It's, it's not always easy to be diligent and keep your routing separate from your business layer. And as your routing and business layers mix, then you end up with situations where it's hard to maintain the speed that you want to move at. So um, you're, you invari invariably end up getting uh, very tightly coupled components instead of having a nice destructured, decoupled architecture. So this is the problem that uh, this product is supposed to solve or that is it intending to solve. Uh, so if we look at uh, just trying to instantiate this trait um, I should actually explain that um, in the server routing logic for this code generator, uh, there are two primary concepts. There are routes and handlers. Handlers are traits that encapsulate business logic, and handlers are the, uh, and sorry, and routes are the uh, OK HTTP routing layer. So if you create a handler, you pass it to the routing layer, and then you have a complete OK HTTP route system. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have other routes in your business logic, you already use OK HTTP for other purposes. You can actually incorporate these generated routes directly into your application with no changes required. So if we try to run this, um, we can see that uh, the error that we get is that we have defined multiple, um, we've defined multiple methods in our Swagger specification. We've defined multiple routes. Uh, if we open up one of them, uh, we can see that this is the uh, create user route. Uh, the route is slash user, the method is post, uh, the operation ID is uh, convenience for the consumer, um, but it's called create user, uh, and the 
parameters that this method takes uh, are a user uh, JSON object in the body of this, uh, in the HTTP payload in the HTTP body. So we can look at the structure of user. Uh, it is composed of these uh, fields. Uh, actually, I lied. It's composed of these fields. Uh, full name, nickname, and ID, which is optional. Uh, it's not in the required list. Uh, this specification is called Swagger. Uh, it is actually the specification from the OpenAPI initiative, uh, OpenAPI like, consortium. Um, it's fairly well supported, and they have code generators for many different languages. Uh, Java is the most supported language in their code generator. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the code generator assumes that your language is no better than Java. So uh, in order to take the full advantage of the type system in Scala, uh, I felt that it was uh, the right thing to do to uh, create a Scala-specific uh, code generator using more recent technologies like uh, Scala Meta, and um, we use uh, cats at, at work. So. Uh, I was primarily targeting cats, but uh, it's open for extensions, so it should be easy enough to swap that out for Scala Z if you have a need for it. Um, so if we go back to the uh, error that we have here, we see that there are three methods, create user, get user, and get friends. So we can go to just the create user method and see it has two parameters. It has the respond uh, singleton parameter, and it has the user that we want to uh, get from the HTTP request. So someone is going to give us a user. We are going to persist that user in the database, uh, and then we are going to respond with one of the valid response types. Um, one of the additional benefits of this code generator is that it is it forces you to be correct in your specification and your implementation. Uh, it's not possible to respond with a HTTP response that's not defined in your Swagger specification. Uh, and this is uh, because the create user response object is structured like this. Um, there are two methods, OK and forbidden. Um, this corresponds in our specification to uh, the response codes here. And we can see that it's only possible to respond with OK or forbidden. Anything else is actually invalid. So uh, because we've expressed this in the type system, this is a compile time error instead of a runtime error. So if your code attempts to do something that is impossible, it won't even compile. And then additionally, we'll see later on that this makes versioning APIs very nice. So providing just a minimal implementation of create user, we completely ignore the supplied user parameter uh, and just return the successful response. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. So uh, what we can do instead is actually provide a real implementation of create user, which uh, takes the supplied user, stores that into the data access object or the database access object. Um, the response type of this store method is actually future of long, which is actually the future of the user ID. So um, if we now do this for comprehension, we're actually working inside of the future and we can just respond with OK uh, as a normal response. Um, if we switch over to the get user um, API, we can look at this specification here. Uh, we actually have uh, the ID parameter in the path, and we have 
uh, two responses, OK, which returns the user, and not found, which returns a string response. So we can look at the implementation. We attempt to get the user out of the database, which produces a future of option of user. And then we use fold to account for whether or not that user was found in the database. Uh, if there was no user, we can respond with not found and provide the string. And if there was a user, we can actually wrap that in OK and pass that back to the user. Uh, even though we're using HTTP verbs here, this is actually not uh, strictly using HTTP uh, or exposing HTTP to the consumer. Um, there is actually a very solid line between the uh, business logic or the business layer and the HTTP routing layer. So as a result, uh, this is intended to permit a very nice uh, level of abstraction by default um, for writing uh, systems using AK HTTP. So we can actually uh, provide a real implementation of this uh, user handler. Uh, I've omitted the bodies here, but uh, when we run this slide, the bodies will be injected uh, correctly. So we can run this. We actually see a lot of stuff happens. We have our actor systems and materializers um, we actually have a database now. Um, but we actually created this routes object. If you're familiar with uh, Akka's type system, or Akka HTTP's types, rather, um, route is the, uh, is the routing layer, the routing object. Uh, it's wrapping some uh, nice function stuff under the hood. But uh, if you have a route, you can bind that to a port and a host, and you can actually listen to HTTP, which is what we are about to do. So I'm going to uh, actually combine the slides, just as an example, combine the slides from the first slide, where we defined our classical style Akka HTTP routes. Uh, I combine the normal routes with our generated routes, and I will bind that to port 8080. So if we run this now, we won't even find the normal routes, because I forgot to run them. But we can fix that. So back to where we were. Now I can run it. And sure enough, it asks if it can bind to a port. Yes, it can. So the, our server is now running. Uh, so I will hit that API with uh, create user. So I, I have curl in a make file. And so you can see the. Uh, the curl command here, where I'm going to post my personal information. And I get back no response from the server, because it was OK. It was, it was an empty HTTP body. There was no error, so uh, we see that the error code is 0. It's coming back from, uh, from curl. But other than that, there was no output. So we can actually alter the API by uh, bumping the revision of our Swagger specification uh, and adding a response body uh, of type string to the create user API. So now, uh, if we try to, uh, when we try to respond, we have to supply a body. We have to actually say, yes, uh, this is the string that's associated with this action in the response. So we can go to the code that we just ran in the previous slide uh, and try to run this, but we actually get an error. Because now the OK parameter requires an argument. This isn't simply the OK empty case object. This is actually a real value that needs to have a parameter associated with it. So we need to supply a string, which we can do here. Uh, so now, instead of ignoring the user ID, we actually capture that and then provide the string interpolated result here. So uh, if we run this, we create a, a new handler with this new um, structure. 
And then we can actually run, oh, sorry, we need to bind it to a port. And then we can uh, run the newer version of this API. We can actually see uh, when we hit 8081, it says created user one. This is really excellent. This is what I wanted. Um, I'm, I know that this is so, somewhat short, um, but I can actually, uh, I'm still in the console and everything is still running. So uh, if there are any questions or if anyone has any uh, uh, desire to see any sort of other changes, um, I'm actually very interested in doing that. So um, this is the end of the overview, but uh, I intentionally left time at the end to discuss uh, adopting this into existing products or ex uh, existing systems. So uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'm open for questions. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, during the presentation, you referred to the fact that uh, this way of uh, defining the API makes versioning of the API easier. Yes. So could you elaborate a little bit on this, please? Of course. Uh, so <clears throat> if we look back at uh, the, uh, I think the primary thing is actually, um, when we, when we applied the diff to our API, when we changed from uh, version 2.0.0 to 2.1.0, um, we, we added a required argument. Uh, usually this would be found either by tests or by uh, someone accidentally discovering this in production. Um, but in our case, because the actual parameters changed in the generated code, now there are required arguments to this OK value. Um, so you'll see the output uh, actually reflected in your type system. If you have um, uh, no unit types or uh, any sort of, um, uh, or no, no, no unit values, uh, and then um, if you have something to warn you against unapplied functions, like in this case, this just flat out, the type didn't match. Um, but if you have uh, more complex systems, I would expect that you would have to make sure that you don't accidentally return the singleton type for OK. But uh, other than that edge case, uh, the versioning of your API actually happens in lockstep with the versioning of your code. So you change the specification file, and you change the code at the same time. It's not an afterthought to update the documentation. You have to change the documentation first in order for the code to be reflected, the change. So that's what Yes, so uh, all of the normal methods for upgrading and versioning uh, uh, sorry, the, the question was, uh, how does the consumer know? Uh, this, is not, uh, this is not communicated to the consumer. Um, so my, my answer there would be that this is a forward compatible change because we're adding a new body for something. We're not deprecating an old API or other things like that. Uh, so if you have actual versioning constraints on your, uh, the way that you do release cycles or the way that you version APIs, uh, the, the advantage here is that the actual server specification is the single point of truth. So uh, it might be an oversimplification to say that this makes things easier, but it's a lot better than digging through either diffs or wiki pages or otherwise, like trying to figure out actually what changed or what do I need to change. And then additionally, uh, one other consideration is if you're generating your, your clients, from Swagger itself, then you can have that client generation as part of your normal build phase, even for your clients. So um, this is actually the setup that I have at work, and it works pretty well.
Hi. Um, I work at Zendesk, so we're, we're almost neighbors. Cool. Um, my question is about this niggling thing where, like, we, we actually do swagger generation from annotations the other way, right? Mm -hmm. And we have the problem that you kind of touched on briefly where there's things like ID, which are database-derived fields, and you want to use the same specification probably for user going both ways, right? But we've got like ID, or you've got created at, or you've got updated at, and you don't want those fields to be options in your case class, right? So how are you supposed to handle that? Uh, so I actually don't fully understand the question. So what I'm saying is I don't want my, if I'm generating a case class from the Swagger specification, yes. I don't want ID to be an option. Ah. Right? Ah. Yeah. I don't, want, I don't want it, I don't know what required actually even means in Swagger. Is it only required when it's a request, or does it reflect what's required when the server's outputting something? You can actually say, uh, there are two aspects here. One is um, read-only parameters. So if you have that parameter default to some value, you can just say ignore it on the inbound path, um, which might help you here. Uh, I think that's actually the intention of the spec in Swagger is to have read-only for ID parameters and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then additionally, uh, another because Swagger is based on JSON's, uh, JSON schema, uh, you can actually abstract the parameters themselves into their own uh, reusable components. So you can have the structure be uh, one request and one response, mm -hmm. uh, and then just link out to those parameters that are actually specified. So you're including like a sub, it's like traits. Basically. Yeah, effectively. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the the each each value is specified, uh, but the structure is different. And your generator works on those too. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I actually have uh, one other thing that I can show, uh, which is uh, probably going to crash because I did not unbind. Oh, I did. Okay, cool. Uh, so one other consideration here is um, to actually, let's see. We can look at the before and after of the generated code to become a, a little bit more uh, comfortable with it. Um, the main reason that, or one of the other reasons that I was very interested in writing this product or writing this project is because uh, the code formatting in uh, Scala Meta is actually very good. Um, it's a, it's a, a real joy to work with. Um, the the Scala Meta developers are are really doing a, gr a great job. So um, just writing, it unfortunately, doesn't respect new lines, but uh, everything of, everything else is great. So um, just looking at the routes, like the routing layer here, you can actually see that um, this is exactly the same code that you would normally write in your system. Like, this is actually uh, standard ACA HTTP. Um, the only main difference is that the respond or the response value that comes back from uh, doing some action, uh, that needs to be handled in, uh, in a type safe and, and complete way. Uh, so we actually, that we, so we've been looking at the handler. The handler is the thing with all the business logic. Uh, so when we call create user, uh, we actually end up getting the, the response back as something that is response mar marshallable. Uh, sorry, translators. Yeah, to response marshallable as um, an ACA HTTP uh, structure for 
encoding some value into an HTTP response. Um, but if you're curious of how, like, how it actually works under the hood, uh, it works pretty straightforwardly just how you would normally write any sort of complex marshaller. Um, the, the only difference is that you're actually matching on the response types and explicitly setting their status codes and explicitly providing their HTTP entities. So you can actually see that even in this case, uh, it's actually still just normal ARC HTTP under the hood, and this is definitely debuggable. This is definitely um, readable. It, it, you can, you're, you're not gonna get some sort of weird macro errors because this is actually, Scalameta generates actual source files uh, on the file system, and that's where uh, errors in your either code or uh, in your comp uh, compiler will show up. So uh, it shouldn't be so uh, difficult to actually uh, adopt any of this stuff. So um, if you're interested in using it, definitely feel free to reach out. So thank you. Oh, yeah. Can you please put back the generated routes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I often need to add some uh, additional directives, like for authentication and so on. Mm -hmm. Is there a way how to add them to the generated code? Uh, you can either uh, compose them at the layer above the route, because... Yeah, well, I usually need it after the post or get. Ah, true. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, that is, with authentication, we have the um, directives being generated in, in the actual uh, code generator, but um, Swagger specifies uh, what kind of authentication parameters you require. Uh, so you can do that, but uh, I don't think it's going to work how you want it to. Yeah, okay, authentication was just an example. Yes, so I, yeah, like I'm aware. Any kind of directive. Is yeah. it possible to um, squeeze them between uh, complete and get? Uh, yeah. That's an interesting question. Uh, that would be actually straightforward to add. Uh, the main question would be uh, whether you want to add those. Uh, so currently, no, it doesn't do it. But uh, whether or not you want it, uh, whether you want to do that at the server construction phase or whether or not you want to specify that in the actual Swagger specification. So uh, if you want to do it in the server um, construction, it should be very straightforward to add. If you want to do it in Swagger, maybe it requires uh, adding additional parameters to the specification. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much.